Good afternoon, everybody. Um, look, today is a really significant day. It's really special for us to, uh, to host John Beckett and to, uh, to have this opportunity here from both John and, and Joe Lacante in their conversation about the Great War. Um, part of what I love about today is it's been something of, uh, of a Paul Harvey day. Now here, here's, here, okay, right, so right. So there's a, a number of folks that have a little more gray in their, in their hair that know exactly what that means. For the rest of you, what that means, there was a gentleman named Paul Harvey and had a radio show that he would take a particular event or a particular item and he would give us the rest of the story, right? So there was always, uh, after you know, 15, 20 minutes of here's how we got to that point, there was something fascinating about you go, wow, I never knew that's how that occurred, right? So at the end of his broadcast, he would always finish with, and now you know the rest of the story, right? So that's sort of what today felt like. Um, John is one of the founding board members of the King's College. What I found out this morning is he wasn't one of the founding board members. He was board member number one, <laughs> uh, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. And the board of the King's College uh, was actually formed in 1996. And so we talked this morning and heard from John about 96, 97, 98, before the King's College 2.0, as, as some of us will refer to it today, actually started in 1999. So that, that's just a, a remarkable opportunity. So let me tell you a little bit more about John, and then we'll invite him up. So John was born in Ohio and graduated from MIT in 1960, uh, after which he worked as an engineer in the aerospace industry, something that I very much appreciate, um, given my background. In 1963, he joined his father's small manufacturing business and became president in 1965 upon the death of his father. The company has grown from what was at that time 12 employees to now more than 1,000 employees on three continents as a worldwide leader in producing engineered components for residential and commercial heating. Mr. Beckett has long been active in both church and community-related activities. He helped found Intercessors for America, a national prayer organization in 1973, and continues to serve on its board. He is a founding board member, you know the rest of the story, of the King's College in New York City and serves on the board of CRU, what formerly known as Campus Crusade for Christ International. His first book, Loving Monday, Succeeding in Business Without Selling Your Soul, was published in 1998 and is now available in 20 languages. A second book, Mastering Monday, A Practical Guide to Integrating Faith and Work, was released in July of 2006. Mr. Beckett's received honorary degree, uh, doctorate of law degrees from Spring Arbor University in 2002 and the King's College in 2008. He's also been named Christian Businessman of the Year by the Christian Broadcasting Network in 1999 and Manufacturing Entrepreneur of the Year in 2003. He lives in Ohio with his wife, Wendy, to whom he has been married since 1961. They have six children and 18 grandchildren. Please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. John Beckett. Well, I feel like I'm coming home every time I come by the King's College. It's wonderful to uh, have this opportunity to, to be together in this setting. It's Founders Day, and King's College has the distinction of being founded twice. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, first of those foundings, as you know, is in 1938, and I had nothing to do with it. Although, if you do the math, I think I was founded the same year, but <laughs> 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 nothing to do with the founding of the college. I was around for its second founding. Uh, this confusion of dates, 1996, 1998, let me see if I can unpack that a little bit. The, the occasion that Tim mentioned uh, where uh, a conversation took place, kind of went like 
this. Uh, I had gone to Orlando to be part of a couple of events down there. One, the uh, 45th anniversary of Campus Crusade. Secondly, the 75th birthday of Dr. Bright. But maybe most strategically, the uh, dedication of the land on which the headquarters of Campus Crusade is located. Now, in the midst of all of that, Dr. Bright asked if he could meet with me, and uh, can I come to your room? Well, I should have seen alarm signals all over that, but <laughs> Dr. Bright was a very hard person to say no to. And uh, on that occasion, he rather directly said, John, we're going to form a college. I'd like you to be the first board member. And by the way, I've just asked Stan Oaks, and he's agreed to be the first president. Um, and by the way, uh, he said, my vision for this, just so you'd understand where we're going, is that in 10 years, we're going to be in 100 cities, we're going to have 10,000 satellite organizations, and we're going to be educating 2 million people. <laughs> now, have any of you had opportunity in times past to be with Dr. Bright? If nothing else, uh, what I've just described underscores that he was a person of vision. And uh, I think uh, in several lifetimes, we may be catching up to just a little bit of that original vision, but somebody's got to cast it and somebody's got to do it. Well, he would be the one to cast it. So that was the initial uh, experience of being with King's. But it wasn't King's then. It was the International Leadership University. And as we look at it historically, that was kind of a placeholder, I think, for what would ultimately emerge. Stan Oaks was the person uh, who discovered kings and bankruptcy and didn't have many assets at that point in time in 1998. A library, not a great one, but a library. A um, claim to some property in Tuxedo, New York, north of here, in a place called Blue Lake. Um, a name, and not a bad name at that, and a president, Dr. Friedhelm Radant, who uh, walked through the bankruptcy process but had a larger vision for, uh, for the future of Kings and stayed around and became our first uh, president once we were reconstituted. We uh, fairly quickly abandoned the Blue Lake concept of an idyllic campus on a lake north of New York City and opted instead for the thriving, uh, if somewhat subnormal, uh, subterranean <laughs> <laughs> location in the Empire State Building. <laughs> that was part Dr. Bright, too, because if, if you communicated with people about kings uh, at that period of time. At best, you'd get an eyebrow raising until you told them that we were in the Empire State Building. And then they'd say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we understand now that you're right in the city. And, and so in a way, that became part of our branding uh, that was strategic, uh, I think, in the early years. Well, maybe enough of that part of the founding. There are lots of stories, uh, but there's one that you've probably never heard, and it's worth recounting on Founders Day. It's the story of the widow's might. Not the one in the Bible, but that's the pattern. Beth Clark was the diminutive wife of a British Bible teacher. Wendy and I agreed to bring her to the U.S. for a prayer conference in 1998. She uh, didn't have a lot to come and go on, and we would said we'd pick up her airfare. When I went to give her the check for $1,000, she said, no, John, she said, I'd like that to go to the college. You see, at that conference, Dr. Bright had been one of our speakers and had cast the vision for 
uh, the King's College. And it so gripped Beth Clark, whose own sons had gone into some of the elite institutions in Great Britain and lost their faith, that she said, we want, uh, we want to see a generation of young people come through college that are not only intact in their faith, but thrive there. I want this $1,000 to go to the college. Now, in the total scheme of things, that really was a widow's might. And what others may not know, I was there, I was part of it, but that gift was instrumental in triggering the first large contribution to the King's College for $5 million uh, at that point in time. And it was seminal in uh, being able to get going. It was our rocket fuel. So the widow's might is never something to be despised, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, or a hundred or a thousand dollars. The Lord is often at work in that. Well, foundations do matter. And uh, teamed up with Joe Lacani today, we want to talk about another foundation. And it's a foundation that has impacted our uh, last century in ways that are profound. This year, in November, we'll celebrate the 100th anniversary of the close of the first war. It wasn't the first war then because it was going to be the war to end all wars and we didn't know there would be a second war, so it was called the Great War. <clears throat> but it was far reaching, it involved 28 nations. Even though the original prospect was that the boys would be home by Christmas, it didn't turn out that way as we know. The legacy of the first war can be chronicled in so many different ways. Between nine and 10 million soldiers lost their lives in that conflict. We know that the aftermath of it brought down empires, four of them to, to be specific. It totally changed the map of Europe and the Middle East. Israel uh, was given a homeland <laughs> out of the, uh, the, the aftermath of the First War. Other nations were created. And so it was a time of enormous upheaval, the effects of which are, in some cases, playing out on the headlines of our newspapers today. Well, um, the war had other consequences, even though it was a popular phrase at the time to say that it was the war to end all wars <laughs> and, uh, and other slogans. The fact of the matter is that the legacy of that war was disruption, it was disease, it's estimated, and I've seen numbers ranging from 25 to 50 million people Civilians lost their lives to disease after the war because the infrastructure of Europe was so devastated. I mean, just staggering numbers. Even during the war itself, in addition to the soldiers who lost their lives, there were as many as five million civilians that died. And so um, one whose name you all know well and have a house named after him had this assessment that, the, that injuries were wrought to the structure of human society, which a century will not efface. And isn't it interesting that here we are a century later, and Churchill was prophetically accurate that the century has not effaced uh, those injuries. Well, we look at the war in terms of these large numbers and seen the hardback version of this. <laughs> He's been withholding it from me. <laughs> but this is, this, this is a beautifully chronicled book. Can I give you a sh short promo for it? Sure. Uh, and, and unlike anything I've ever done, is so wonderfully documented. I mean, you go to the back of it and you just see the 
classic scholar with all of his footnotes and references. Beautifully done. Thank you. This was the large picture of the war, and of course the particular angle is how it affected both Tolkien and Lewis. Um, your professor will maybe say a few more words about that later, but I want to just go for a few minutes from the, the mega picture of the war to uh, one specific, the life of a soldier in this war. So just bear with me for a few minutes. It's, it's a soldier story, and we're going to meet this soldier first as a young man, the third from the right. Um, his name is Reg, and he grew up in a, a well-to-do family in Hamilton, Ontario. His father was a wholesale grocer, and uh, he had five brothers, as you'll see there, and a sister. At age 13, uh, he was in some ways a budding entrepreneur, and he uh, actually would, as the story goes, take um, mint out of his parents' garden and bundle it up, put a, a band around it, and take it to local grocers to sell with, this, with, with, uh, with their spring lamb. And so even at that age, he was looking for ways to uh, <laughs> break into the, the world of, of business. Well, um, the first war commenced as far as Great Britain was concerned on the 4th of August, 1914. That was the day that England declared war on Germany. That declaration being a direct result of Germany's decision to go through neutral Belgium, and as it turned out, wreaking enormous damage along the way. But that defiance of Belgium's neutrality was what it ultimately took for Great Britain to mobilize, and that became the Western Front along with France. You've heard the term Western Front. Well, Germany ended up fighting on two fronts, the Russian Front to the east and the Western Front, which was uh, principally uh, France and the British forces, but as I mentioned, in total, 28 nations got engulfed in this war. <clears throat> The, the um, conversations I can imagine around the dinner table would have gone something like this. Young Reg, now age 16, I want to be among those who enlist. Uh, and I'm almost 17. And by the way, the draft agencies aren't fussing all that much about age anyway. <laughs> Look at the way they're lining up to recruit, and I want to be one of those. They say we're going to be home by, by Christmas, and I don't want to miss the action. And the parents, uh, ever level-headed and looking after their son, said, we're going to finish college first. Let's see how this unfolds. We'll talk about it. But if you're really keen on ultimately participating in this, and if it's still going, Let's, um, let, let's have you take some artillery training and uh, learn some things about horsemanship, and, and then we'll see. Well, indeed, Reg did uh, take up that challenge, went to a military uh, institution in Kingston, Ontario, and uh, developed the skill set that would enable him to uh, become uh, a gunner to, to field artillery in that war. He graduated from Hamilton Collegiate in the spring of 1916 and uh, went into a recruitment office in St. Catharines, Ontario and signed up to uh, join <laughs> Her Majesty's Army. Now, um, things were different on July 1st, 1916, because that was the day the Battle of the Somme 
commenced. Um, the, the date on this enlistment order, the attestation paper as they called it, was July 4, 1916. Now what's the significance of this juxtaposition? The Battle of the Somme was the largest battle that had been fought at that time. It was months in the planning and Great Britain on that first day alone, Joe, lost just shy of 20,000 soldiers killed and another 40,000 wounded, if I have the stats correct. Just to th think about that. Now, we, we, in your lifetime, we've had the, the war in Iraq where I think the total number that died over a four-year period was just short of 4,000. Is that right? So in one day, 20,000 British soldiers died. And yet, it was three days later that my dad went into a recruiting office. Did I say my dad? I let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> you know why he's a hero now, right? In my estimation. Well, on into more extensive training at a makeshift camp in northern Ontario. Uh, months of, uh, of basic training and then uh, overseas on what turned out to be the sister ship of the Lusitania, the Mauritania, arriving in England uh, for more training in Shorncliffe down on the, the, the chalky white cliffs of Dover. And uh, on March uh, the 23rd of 1917, crossed the English Channel to engage his first battle. The, the, the Battle of Vimy Ridge had been planned for months and uh, would commence just two weeks after his arrival, engaging all four Canadian divisions. Some 60,000 troops were involved in trying to take a ridge that had been heavily fortified by the Germans and enough so that both the French and British armies had been repulsed in earlier attempts. The Battle of Vimy Ridge over Easter Sunday 1917 from the 9th to the to the 13th um, was very costly. 3,600 Canadian soldiers died in that battle. Double that number were injured, so some 10,000 plus casualties out of, uh, out of a, an army of, of, of 60,000 men. But they took the ridge. And uh, it was a seminal battle. Uh, and for Reg Beckett, his first direct exposure in a war that would not just uh, end by Christmas, but would go on for another 18 months. So in battle after battle from that point forward, he was in the thick of it. Uh, the war that was known as the war fought out of the trenches. And while he wasn't in the trenches per se, <laughs> he was a bit further behind in the artillery he was very much a part of uh, a war that saw hand-to-hand -hand combat, that saw uh, barbed wire, that saw a million horses involved in rat-infested, uh, lice-infested trenches. It's hard for us to imagine the circumstances under which they fought that war. The Battle of Passingdale fought in the north of Belgium. I've traipsed over those battlefields. Um, is the lowlands. And the lowlands could work okay when you could drain water out to the North Sea. They didn't work so well when they had gone through multiple uh, years of shellings and successive battles, totally destroying the infrastructure. So the mud was so deep that it would, on occasion it would, it would envelop horses, it would envelop men, and, and, and soldiers were drowned alive, being sucked down into the mud. Uh, from ter these rains that just couldn't dissipate. I mean, by any measure, uh, this was one of the cruelest, most difficult wars that has ever been fought. Well, you've seen some of the images of it, the marred fields, the trenches. 
And occasionally, the victory celebrations, by the way, the first war in which tanks were used. Do you know what the first tank was? It was armor plate welded under tractors. <laughs> and uh, the first war in which planes were used, machine guns for the first time, because they figured they needed more than the carrier pigeons they started with uh, in, in August. And so it was a war that technology took a large role in. The machine gun was, was uh, so instrumental as a killing device on both sides. The use of chemicals, very much in the news today, was initiated uh, in, in that war. So um, the war ended. And uh, <laughs> both sides wanted to believe that God was on their side. Uh, the Germans doubled down on this with their belt buckles. You see one here, uh, Gott mit uns. And uh, they were pro-offering that, that God was with us, to which some of the Canadian forces, it's told, would hold a sign out of the trench and saying, that's nothing, we got mit uns too. <laughs> Rare little chapters of humor in the terrible war. Mons, Belgium. Reg Beckett was there on the day the war ended. And uh, the historians at the time referred to the subdued nature of the soldier's reaction. Could this really be true? Was it going to hold? And so while wild celebrations were happening in New York and Paris and London and even in Moans, uh, the soldiers were more cautious. So I want you to picture the scene that you see here, which is actually a picture of Moans on November 11, 1918. And imagine a little girl stepping out of that crowd and somehow picking out a British slash Canadian soldier that she wanted to give a present to. Well, it happened to be Reg Beckett. And the present that she wanted to give him was a little brooch of herself to thank him for helping secure their freedom. He pinned it on his uniform, and undoubtedly it was one of the most treasured moments of his three years in the war. Well, I'm going to draw some things to a close, but you always want to extract the lessons that you can from such a, uh, an amazing chapter out of a person's life. And I worked with my dad for a year. He suddenly passed away at age 67, well over 50 years ago now, but that year was very special because I got to see him up close and see some of the character qualities that made him who he was. What I didn't realize, because soldiers seldom talk about their war experiences, was how some of these character qualities were forged on the Western Front. And I'll just cite three, and I have lots of evidence to back it up, both from the war experiences and what I observed personally. And these are transportable lessons. The first is his love for family. Uh, and it worked both ways. My grandfather sent letters or parcels on the average every other day for three years. Can you imagine that? These had to go on troop carriers across the North Atlantic. They had to be worked up to the front. And not all of them made it. But because all of the letters and parcels were numbered, we know that there was this incredible outpouring of affection and provision uh, going across to the soldier. We don't have um, all of the letters that my grandfather sent, but we have many of the letters that my dad sent. Because my grandfather, in receiving the handwritten letters from my dad, would sit down at a typewriter and type them out with multiple carbon copies to distribute to his siblings. And this whole adventure for me 
doing this deep dive into the first war began when we came across a set of those letters about five or six years ago. And uh, it, it's been an amazing journey to uh, discover this. In one of his letters, he says, I wouldn't worry too much, dear, for it really doesn't pay. As I've said before, I worry far more about you at home than I ever worry about myself. He was doing all he could to allay the fears of his parents, but the love for family was, was clearly vital to him. The second that emerges out of my study of this period was his sense of responsibility, and I've already cited that in a way with his recruitment just days after the Battle of the Somme began. Uh, one of the letters home, <laughs> he says, this is the only place for us to be at such a critical time. Even now, I've been here since March and away from home for over a year. I really feel ashamed I was not one of the first. <laughs> Imagine, I mean, at 16, he wanted to be one of the first to be in, and only his parents, uh, putting out a bit of a drag anchor, said, no, you're, it's, it's not your time. <laughs> but his heart was to serve his country in that way. And a third attribute um, that I would note is perseverance, and I won't read this excerpt in, in its entirety from his letter, but he's trying to dry out some laundry. And he's basically saying it's really tough to get laundry dried <laughs> in this old German dugout where we're 30 to 40 feet below <laughs> below the surface of Mother Earth. And uh, so it was just, a little bit of an insight into the <laughs> some of the practical challenges that a soldier had in that war. These three, however, um, I think all form life lessons and can for us. I tie it into the 20 year run that we've had here at King's, uh, a, a passion for the mission, <laughs> a sense of responsibility that what we're doing here really matters and it's worthy of our best efforts. And have we had to persevere? <laughs> um, many times we were at the point of despair and then God would take us the next step. We've had to learn perseverance ourselves. I'm gonna close close with a remarkable picture this was taken in 1894. It was 20 years before the war commenced. Curiously, 20 years is our span here. Brian, you would know who <laughs> the cast of characters is here, maybe emanating from the black bedecked woman in the front row, Queen Victoria. But closer inspection helps us see who some of the other cast of characters are. In that picture, all related, Wilhelm II of Germany, Tsar Nicholas of Russia, Edward VII, who had become the King of England. Do you realize that these primary combatants in the Great War were related to each other? Talk about love of family. <laughs> And this is a very sobering dimension of the backstory of that hugely costly war. The combatants were members of the same family. <laughs> think about that and think about the consequences. What if, now here's just speculation, what if they had had love of family? <laughs> where they could defer to one another, where they could work things out, where they could ask forgiveness, where they could uh, sort things through. Where was their sense of responsibility? Of course, none of them knew what would cascade out of the events they were about to undertake. But even in their wildest dreams, they could have imagined it would be more than uh, honor and glory and some of the other terms that were popular at the time, it would be devastating. It would be hugely costly. But they didn't have that sense and they didn't persevere in working things through 
in a civil way. They set aside some of the basic inclinations that we as human beings uh, should embrace in plunging ahead with something that would change the face of the world for 100 years. And what if, what if, what if they had known the Lord and had embraced the gospel? <laughs> Just think about that. When we think about the implications of being followers of Christ and realize just from this picture how the course of history would have been altered if people had been able to come together as brothers and sisters and find a better way. So one of the expressions that was popular um, among the, the, the British families, almost all of whom were affected in one way or another, was that they all did their part, you know, whether they knit socks or sent provisions abroad or wrote letters, everybody had a role in doing their part. So that's the challenge to us, isn't it? I, uh, I used the fitness center where I stayed last night and <laughs> I, they had a little sign up there to help motivate people on their treadmill workout. I thought it was telling and appropriate, and I'll close with this. It was a quotation by the great tennis player, Arthur Ashe. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. <laughs> That's kind of a good motto for all of us as we go through the, the challenges of life. Thanks. <laughs> now I now I get the Lacani signal. Great. Thank you, John. For that. I'm going to be very brief here, friends, because I want to get into a Q&A here in just a few minutes. So just a few thoughts to throw out. John, thanks for that terrific talk. It's so fun sharing the stage here with John because his father served in the First World War. My grandfather, Michael Michele Loconte, served in the First World War. And just a quick, quick background on that. My grandfather was doing what so many Italian immigrants did at the beginning of the 20th century here in the United States. He's going from city to city, making money, sending it back home. So when the war breaks out, and America gets involved in 1917, well, the Italians want to get him into the Italian army because, of course, he's Italian from a little village in southern Italy. And the Americans say, look, you fight for us, uh, Lacanti, and we'll make you a citizen. I think grandfather, Grandpa Lacanti thought about that for about five seconds <laughs> and chose to fight for the Americans. Went in, into Belgium in 1918 and then to Mousargon in 1918 don't know too much of the details, survived, survived the war, naturalized as an American citizen, and, and here we are. That's pretty fun. So it's a great story. Uh, just a couple of thoughts here about how our lives, both our lives, uh, John, were so affected by the war. If you think about it through the family trees, through our, your father and my grandfather. Uh, but other lives, so many other lives were affected as well, and of course, the two people I've been looking at in my, in my work, uh, Tolkien and Lewis, J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, it's just a remarkable story, and just a snapshot of this, because I think it relates. What these guys went through uh, in the war and then after the war, I think it connects so much with our own uh, lives here, John. So just a couple of thoughts here. Uh, you know, when Tolkien, when Tolkien uh, came out of this thing, he had lost most of his closest friends. Both Tolkien and Lewis lost most of their closest friends in, uh, in the war. And that just created a sense of, his children said, it created in their father a kind of a lifelong sadness. He never quite got over it, is how he said. And, and I'll just, uh, I hate the quote from a Lacanti book, but let me just do that here for a moment. Uh, it really pains me, you know how it is. Um, but it's, quote, it's, it's Tolkien I'm, I'm quoting from. He says, um, he bemoaned the collapse of all my world. He just felt like at 21, 22, it's all going to seed. His whole life is being interrupted. He had so much he wanted to do. Going off to Oxford is what his hope was, and now he's dragged into this war. He was not a, an enthusiastic combatant at all. And then he says, um, he says, it isn't the tough stuff one minds so much. 
he writes, I was pitched into it all just when I was full of stuff to write and of things to learn, and I never picked it all up again. Full of stuff to write, and I never picked it all up again? The Lord of the Rings? The <laughs> Hobbit? Imagine what he might have produced, given this, if he'd not been cast into the war. I don't know, but you can look at it, of course, the other way. The war itself, I believe, really fired his imagination in so many ways. But he felt that so much of his life had been robbed from him at that age. So much to do, so much to think and to think about and to write, and it was taken from him. Well, there was a huge just mood of, of, of gloom and disillusionment uh, after the war. Uh, Lewis said this, actually, just while well, he's just recovering from his wounds. He's writing to his father in a, from a hospital bed. He says, I could sit down and cry over the whole business, and yet, of course, we have both much to be thankful for. If I'd not been wounded when I was, I should have gone through a terrible time. Nearly all my friends in the battalion are gone. And he said he carried memories of the war. He had memories of it. They invaded his dreams for years afterwards, told, uh, Lewis says. But in all that difficulty and trauma, there's also incredible moments of grace. And I think we'll get into this here in the, in the Q&A. John, I want to hear from you and your, and your dad on this. Moments of grace. So for example, just one little example. Lewis, who went into the war as an atheist, comes out of the war as an atheist. He's an atheist in a foxhole. Here's what he's writing from his hospital bed to one of his friends. Um, he took a train to get to this hospital across the English countryside into London. Here's what he wrote. Can you imagine how I enjoyed my journey to London? First of all, the sight and the smell of the sea that I've missed for so long, and these long and weary months, and then the beautiful green country seen from the train. I think I never enjoyed anything so much as that scenery, all the white in the hedges and the fields, so full of buttercups that in the distance, they seem to be of solid gold. He's just gripped with this image of the natural beauty of the English countryside, and it does something to him. It begins to challenge his materialism, and we know it from his letter because he goes on. He says, you see, the conviction is gaining ground on me that after all, spirit, with a capital S, does exist. I fancy there is something, capital S, something, right outside, time and place. You see how frankly I admit that my views have changed. So there's this kind of moment of what? Beauty and grace that's beginning to challenge his materialism and it's happening in the midst of this war, the trauma of this war. So if I had to say uh, just a couple of things here about what did it mean to these guys? And uh, John, you talked about um, family and, and perseverance. I think we'll get into this in the Q&A. Friendship, friendship. The friendship that emerges between Tolkien and Lewis that I'm sure your father had with uh, men in his battalion, but this friendship that becomes one of the most consequential friendships, if you think about it, in the 20th century, given the influence of their, of their writings, The Lord of the Rings, The Chronicles of Narnia, over 100 million copies of The Chronicles translated in dozens of languages. It's hard to imagine a more consequential friendship than that between Tolkien and Lewis in the 20th century. And there's one quote here that I have to share, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and we'll get a Q&A. Uh, Lewis has just gotten from, uh, from Tolkien the manuscript for The Lord of the Rings. It's finally finished. Tolkien's been working on it for years. Lewis has been his one great, greatest champion and, and cheerleader to get this thing done. You know, pestering him every time they get together for a drink, for a beer. Pestering him, give me more, toddlers, give me more. And he gets the manuscript, and, um, and this is what he says. He writes in a letter to, to Tolkien about the, uh, the impact of the book, what he thinks the book means to both of them, Lewis to Tolkien. He says, um, so much of your whole life, so much of our joint life, so much of the war, so much that seemed to be slipping away without a trace into the past is now, in a sort, made permanent. It's just a mysterious thing. He's saying, Somehow Tolkien has captured something of their joint life together, their joys and their struggles, and it's hidden in the pages of that book, The Lord of the Rings. That's what he's saying. That's remarkable. That's a remarkable friendship. So if I had to say what I think their story is about, what I think for your, for your dad and in some ways for my grandfather, it's three words. It's war, it's friendship, and beauty. Because it's the war that makes possible the friendship between these two great authors. 
And it's their friendship that makes possible these amazing works that embody moral beauty. War, friendship, beauty. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation. Well, I'm going to be the moderator here, uh, the friendly interrogator, uh, John. And um, one of the questions I've got to ask you, uh, you mentioned uh, 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 your dad uh, getting some training before he went off to war. But I, I kind of want to know, did the training prepare him for anything that he really faced there on the front? Well, Do you have any sense of that? Well, it trained him in a technical sense. Uh, artillery was used, uh, not the first time artillery had been used at war, but uh, it had never been used on the scale that it was used. Yeah. Uh, his niche was what was called the 18-pounder. Now, an 18-pound shell would be, you know, roughly this this tall, and it was very instrumental in the war. But he developed the technical skills. You had to know how to compensate for uh, distance and wind conditions and, and many other factors if you were going to be effective with your artillery. Did it equip him in any sense for the psychological aspect? Uh, I can't believe it did. I don't know how you would ever prepare for that. Uh, yeah. because yeah. it was anything but clinical, and uh, yeah. you just had to, to be there and experience yeah. it. And I, my, my, my dad didn't talk about these things. That should be no surprise to you. It's common among people out of a military experience. But um, I, I would guess two things. One, he wanted to sp spare his family uh, the accounts, but you also try to put those things behind you. You have to somehow become inured to those experiences in a way that, so. Well, that's the follow-up I want to ask yeah. you on that, on that point, because so many men, we don't know what the numbers are ultimately, but a lot of men, uh, the whole idea of trench warfare, the constant pounding, the shells, you can't poke your head up a, an inch above the, the trench line because you'll get shot with this, because of the snipers. We, we just had no mental category for this kind of combat. And so there were thousands of soldiers, ex-soldiers then, veterans, wandering the streets of the European capitals with shell shock, what we call shell shock, what we call post-stress disorder. Uh, and it's, so, it's like so much of Europe was kind of a, uh, a shell shock soldier. That was kind of the psychological mood of so many people. My question for you, John, is do you have any sense of how your dad was able to come out of yeah, that yeah, and, 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 and manage it? Do you, any clue at all from the letters? Well, and <laughs> I, I read somewhere there were 60,000 British soldiers in insane asylums after mm. the war. Wow. Uh, you know, shell shock was really too light <laughs> a term. Mm. In fact, I think one of the miracles is that he was um, spared as much of that as he was. I saw him be ultra cautious in some ways. If he went into a hotel to stay, he would check first for fire exits to know how he would, I, I don't even think about that when I go into a hotel today, but he wanted to know how mm. he would get out. Mm. He would go in, and this is a different era, but the first thing he'd do when he walked into his room in a hotel was grab the corner of the sheets and fling them back to make sure there weren't roaches in there. <laughs> and so when you've been in insect infested areas, you learn things. And so I, I would see these little traces, but psychologically, I think it's just amazing that he yeah. survived as well as he did. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I got another question for you. Yeah. Uh, in the book, and it's a beautiful book. I'm gonna plug your book now if I could. Okay. Uh, beautifully illustrated book. Um, and the discovery of those letters is one of the conversations I've had with my family. We can't find, but no one knows if my grandfather uh, wrote letters back home. I'm sure he did. We don't know where they could be. But the letters from your dad are really remarkable. And uh, one of them here, uh, you said in the talk about the soldiers weren't quite sure, even though they're talking about the end of the war, that it really could be over. This has gone on and on and on with no, it's been a stalemate essentially for four years, right? And here's what uh, your dad wrote. The news today seems almost too good to be true, but hostilities ceased at 11 o'clock this morning. And if they don't start again, I guess it means we'll have peace at last. 
Oh dears, it's almost impossible to believe the war is over, but I expect we'll know positively within a day or so when he goes on. And I just think, I, I'm not sure how to put the question, but um, do you have a sense from your dad about what that must have felt like to finally come to the end of the thing? And what I wish I did. In fact, um, I suspect that many of you have parents who are still alive. And one of my regrets is that I didn't, I, that I wasn't more proactive in, in trying to draw out from my dad some of these early experiences, even though they would have been painful for him to talk about. I think he would have uh, as part of the legacy. But I was too much in my own world, and yeah. I, I didn't know yeah. the questions to ask. I didn't take yeah. the time to ask them. Yeah. But um, it's a remarkable thing to me that we have a letter yeah. dated November 11, yeah. <laughs> 1918, <laughs> it's incredible. the day the war <laughs> ended. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. so, <laughs> but. <laughs> what would you say, uh, John, maybe following that up, mm -hmm. the, uh, um, the most surprising thing that you discovered, or well, one of the most surprising things in the letters, and then we want to throw it open to these guys, I think, to Q&A, but one of the most surprising things from, from the letters, would you say, that you discovered? I think maybe it shouldn't be a surprise, but um, I, I never knew my grandparents, but I know enough of the stories of my grandmother to know that she would have been wrought with anxiety as probably most parents were. You never knew when you were going to get that announcement. <laughs> and uh, so the measures that he went to, to both <laughs> withhold information that would be distressing, yeah. but assure as he could yes. that he was all right. Yes. And uh, yes. That, uh, that, that was a demonstration of his, his care for the family back wow. home as wow. best he could. Wow. Toward the end, though, uh, there is a letter that, uh, for the first time, uh, acknowledges that he didn't know that he would return. Mm. And uh, so that was a little bit of a window into some of the, mm. the, the doubts that had to be just wow. totally normal. You, wow. you didn't know from day to day whether you'd survive. Wow, wow. Remarkable guy. Okay, we want to throw it open for questions here. Uh, guys, I don't know if there's a micro uh, microphone floating around. The, f the floor is open. And I'm just going to move it forward. <laughs> Come on down to the Santa Billy Grand Crusades. Come on down. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Come on down. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it was uh, extraordinary to hear uh, all of that. Um, I just wonder if you see any connection um, between the, the rupture of the hope and uh, optimism of the Edwardian era uh, by the Great War and the uh, shattering of the sense of peace coming out of the 1990s uh, that happened at, with September 11th and the subsequent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I want to make sure I'm getting at the heart of your question. Are you, are you any kind of a linkage from the Great War to 9-11? Uh, just sort of um, culturally. I know Dr. Lafonte talks about in his, his book, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a sort of uh, sense that um, the, the project of modernity was ushering us into this sort of new era of, of peace and the war to end all wars and that this would be it. Mm -hmm. um, and then from what I remember it, in the 1990s, there was a sense of, of peace in the world, um, smaller scale wars and, and things were, were gonna be better going forward into this new millennium. Mm. Um, but then very quickly we found out that that wasn't quite true. And I was okay, I'm sorry. So the yeah. parallelism between what was happening then and what happened right, more recently. And I guess particularly uh, yeah. as well, John, maybe just to set it up, the, uh, the, the, the 1990s with the end of the Cold War does produce this sense of, hey, there are no more threats. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an era of peace and prosperity now. Mm -hmm. No more threats. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, Margaret Macmillan is one of the historians who's written on the first war. She wrote Paris 1919, and then subsequent to that, she wrote um, a definitive book 
called The War That Ended Peace. Curious title. What did she mean? Uh, Europe essentially had experienced 100 years of peace since the Napoleonic period. Now they'd had some local incursions, the Crimean War, the uh, Franco-Prussian War, but they were, they were defined and they were regional. The world at that time in the early, to, the early 1900s, um, it really was the belief that, that it was beyond uh, any kind of major conflict. And I think the parallelism with our more recent experience has to be sobering because uh, what's being denied in that mentality is the sinfulness of man, which wasn't redeemed then, <laughs> isn't redeemed now. And we're one Gavriel Princept away <laughs> from trigger events mm -hmm. that can move us into the next conflict. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we don't want to live in fear, we have to live in the reality mm -hmm. that uh, things can unravel very fast. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, and maybe it's to compliment that, John. Terrific point. Uh, in the 1990s, with the end of the, of, of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Francis Fukuyama, the political theorist, writes this famous uh, article and then book, The End of History. It's the end of any kind of conflicts. No more ideological challenges to the democratic capitalist West. They're all gone. He's not thinking about Islam. He's not thinking about Islam at all. He doesn't see these, the, the power of religion, uh, especially a, a, a corrupted religious faith, to bring about great evil. And he's not thinking ultimately about the nature of man, is he? and the fall of man. He just sees the end of history. Well, uh, the columnist uh, Charles Krauthammer uh, called that a holiday from history. We were taking a holiday from history in the 1990s, uh, but then history reasserts itself. The history of the tragedy of the human condition reasserts itself, doesn't it, on 9-11, on, on if that helps answer that very good question. We got time for a couple more? How's, it, how's the clock running, yeah? We've got time for one more? We have time for no more. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, how about a round of applause here for John and the time together? <laughs>